Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video we're going to continue our series on shock by talking about anaphylactic shock. And after you watch this YouTube video, don't forget to take the free quiz that will test you on this condition. So let's get started. Anaphylactic shock occurs when there's an introduction of an allergen in the body. And this introduction leads the mast cells or basophils to release massive amounts of histamine and other substances system wide. Now histamine plays a huge role in anaphylactic shock and it causes all these particular signs and symptoms on the body that leads to a decrease in tissue perfusion. So we know from all of our other shock videos, whenever we have something causing decreased tissue perfusion, we have shock. So that's what anaphylactic shock is. We have this allergen that has triggered this response in the body, massive amounts of histamine is being released, and we're getting decreased tissue perfusion, hence we're having shock. Now anaphylactic shock is a type of distributive shock, which means that the small vessels in the body that deliver all that nutrient, specifically oxygen, to the cells that make up our tissues and organs are disruptive. They're having an issue distributing blood flow. And this is really coming back to the effects of all this histamine that's being released. Some of the things that's occurring is massive vasodilation. So those vessels are widening and blood is not really flowing. Also, you're gonna get increased capillary permeability. And this is gonna shift fluid out of that intravascular space into the interstitial space. And we're gonna have an issue getting blood flow to those cells. Now, how does an allergen actually enter in the body where this whole reaction is going to take place? Well, there's various routes that an allergen can actually enter the body. Number one, they can enter through an injection of some type that we give the patient or inhalation, the person inhales their particular allergen that can cause anaphylaxis. Or they can take it orally where they ingest it with like food or even some medications or the skin, it comes into contact with the skin. Now, what are some known substances that actually cause anaphylaxis that can lead to anaphylactic shock? Well, one thing of course is foods. This can be anything from shellfish, peanuts, eggs, milk, or medications like IV contrast dye, vaccines, NSAIDs, antibiotics, specifically like penicillin, or insect venom like bees, a lot of people are allergic to bee stings, latex can cause it, along with physical exercise. Some people, their anaphylaxis is triggered by exercise. And then of course, there's cases where we just don't know what the cause of the anaphylaxis is, and we refer to that as idiopathic. Now let's talk about what is occurring in the body during anaphylactic shock. And to do that, we have to talk about the two different types of reactions that a patient can have that can lead them to enter into anaphylactic shock. The first type of reaction is called an anaphylactic reaction. And this is due to the immune system. The immune system sees that allergen, so in response to that, it creates the antibody IgE. So it's IgE related. The other type is called anaphylactoid reaction. And this really isn't related to the immune system. The body in this type of reaction isn't creating the antibody IgE, so it's not related to it. So first let's dissect anaphylactic reaction. So it's related to the immune system, specifically this IgE that has been created in response to the allergen. So in order for this anaphylactic reaction to occur, that patient has to undergo sensitization. And then once that patient is sensitized to this allergen, this reaction can occur. So it's known as a type one hypersensitivity reaction. So let's look at how this reaction happens. So we have this allergen that enters the body and whenever it comes into the body, it's going to trigger the body to produce IgE antibodies. So these IgE antibodies are going to go and attach to the surface of the mast cell or basophil, and they're gonna hang out there for a while. So right here, whenever this occurs, the patient has been sensitized. This was their first exposure to the allergen. Now let's say next week, the person is exposed to the same allergen again. So they have a subsequent exposure to this allergen. Now what's 
going to happen is that we have these IgE antibodies on this mast cell or basophil. Well, this allergen is going to go and bind with those IgE antibodies. And this is going to trigger this cell to release histamine and other mediators. And we're going to get this reaction. And here in a moment, we're going to talk in depth about the role of histamine and how it affects the body in anaphylactic shock. But some of the things that histamine is going to do, it's going to increase capillary permeability and it's going to cause major vasodilation. Now with anaphylactoid reaction, it's not related to IgE. And so the person doesn't have to be sensitized for the reaction to occur. What's going to happen is that you can have various substances that can lead to an anaphylactoid reaction. They can be like IV contrast dye, NSAIDs, or chemotherapy agents. They get in there, they can attack the membrane of the mast cell or the basophil, cause it to break down. And whenever that happens, histamine is going to be released. So you're going to have like the same type of reaction, signs and symptom wise, of how you would in the anaphylactic reaction where we have IgE being responsible. But the thing with this anaphylactoid is because it's not IgE related, that patient doesn't have to be sensitized because we don't need the IgE to be present on that cell because it's directly going to affect that cell in this anaphylactoid. So it can happen with the very first exposure. Now let's talk about the signs and the symptoms that are occurring during anaphylactic shock. Now, as the nurse, you want to be able to recognize these little subtle signs and symptoms that you may see in your patient or they may tell you to let you know, hey, they may be going into anaphylaxis, anaphylactic shock, and this will cause you to intervene. So we will prevent them from actually entering into severe shock territory where they're going to have decreased tissue perfusion to their cells and organs, which could lead to death. So to talk about our signs and symptoms, first we need to talk about histamine. Because histamine is what's really causing all of our problems and why you're seeing these signs and symptoms. And when we talk about nursing interventions and treatments, our interventions and treatments are geared to reversing the effects that this histamine has done to our body. So one thing that histamine does that causes us major issues is vasodilation. And when you have enough histamine, you can vasodilate everything throughout this body. And it's going to cause your vessels to widen. And whenever vessels widen, what does that do to blood pressure? It drops it. And this is going to decrease the amount of blood that's going to flow to the cells that make up our tissues and organs. It's going to deplete them of oxygen and they're going to get stressed out and they're going to die because that blood is going to be pulling and not going where it's supposed to go. In addition, histamine increases our heart rate so you can see tachycardia. It also increases capillary permeability of your vessels. So it makes your vessels leaky. So fluid that's in that inner um, intervascular space is going to move out and leak into the interstitial space. So whenever you have this, this will even further drop our blood pressure because we have like no blood volume in the intervascular space, so we'll lead to that. It's also going to cause more swelling because the fluid is going to leave the intervascular sp space and go into the tissue. So you can have swelling. This can cause issues with our airway if we have the swelling up in this area. It can also play a role in decreasing our cardiac output because if our fluids leaving our intervascular space, what's really draining back to the heart? Not a lot. So that's going to decrease cardiac output. It's not going to have the heart, the heart's not going to have enough blood to pump through the body if we're losing fluid. In addition, histamine causes itching. Now, another big thing that's dangerous that histamine causes is that it causes bronchoconstriction. So this is where you have narrowing of your airways. So your patient's not going to be able to breathe. They will go into respiratory failure. It also affects our GI system, which will cause gastric secretions to increase, and it increases the contraction of our smooth muscle in our GI system. So we can start getting 
GI related um, signs and symptoms. So whenever you're thinking about these signs and symptoms, think about the system because histamine is going to affect the respiratory system, cardiac system, GI and skin. So let's quickly go over these signs and symptoms. Respiratory, we know we're having narrowing of our airways. So what's our, your patient gonna look like? They're gonna have difficulty breathing. Wheezing from where air is trying to flow through those narrow airways, you can hear that swelling in the upper airways and they can have report, they feel tightness in their throats, hard to swallow. They may even have issues speaking to you. They'll be coughing. Also, they can have watery eyes, stuffy nose, the lovely effects of histamine. Cardiac wise, their blood pressure from that massive vasodilation is going to drop. They can have hypo, hypotension. Um, they can have increased heart rate from that tachycardia. And because of their blood pressure going so low, that hypotension, they can lose consciousness as well. GI system, because of the increased secretions, increased contraction of that GI smooth muscle, they can have vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, GI pain, and the skin, we have ma major vasodilation going on. So, and histamine makes you itchy, so your skin can be itchy, red, and swollen. Now let's wrap up this lecture and let's talk about nursing interventions and treatments for our patient with anaphylactic shock. So first of all, as a nurse, what do you think is one of the most important things we can do to make sure our patient doesn't go into anaphylactic shock? Well, it would be following preventative measures, making sure we are always assessing our patient's allergies. And this is done best on admission, asking them, what are you allergic to? Have you ever had an anaphylactic reaction? If so, what happened during it? Making sure we're aware of that. Then we go and we document that, put it where it's supposed to go. So pharmacy, doctors, other nurses, other people who are part of the healthcare team can know that this patient has these allergies. And before you do anything, give a patient a new medication, do any type of procedure that's gonna be using something that's one of those known substances that can cause anaphylaxis, we make sure that we're reviewing our patient's allergies and always avoiding them. Now sometimes, as we learn with anaphylactoid reactions, those patients don't have to be sensitized to the allergen. It can happen with first exposure. And with that, we wanna make sure that we're aware of those little subtle signs and symptoms that we were talking about with what can happen in anaphylactic shock. Now let's talk about nursing interventions and treatments a little bit deeper. So we've established that you want to recognize those signs and symptoms because this can happen, anaphylactic reaction can happen within seconds to minutes of exposure. So to help us remember these nursing interventions and treatments, let's remember the phrase act fast because as a nurse we want to act fast if this occurs because we want to reverse the effects. So A would be for allergen and airway. If we know or suspect this particular thing is causing a patient's anaphylaxis, we want to remove it. Or if they're started on a new IV antibiotic, we want to stop that medication until we can determine what's going on. Airway, remember histamine can cause that bronchoconstriction. So we wanna make sure we're managing that airway and giving them high flow oxygen. You're also going to be con doing continuous monitoring of their vital signs. Then C for call rapid response or initiate any the emergency system wherever you're at. You wanna get this patient treatment. You need help when caring for this patient. You can't do it all by yourself. So you're gonna start CPR if that is needed until help arrives. Then T for Trendelenburg position. This position is going to help with what's going on. Remember, we have massive vasodilation. We have a drop in blood pressure. And the Trendelenburg position is where you lay the patient subine with their legs elevated. Now, you want to be wary of this position if you have a patient who's actively vomiting and um, if they're having really major airway issues because this could make it worse. So if they're vomiting, you may want to lay them on their side so they don't aspirate the emesis. So what this position is going to do is it's going to increase the venous return to the heart, so that blood return to the heart, and um, increase our cardiac output and blood pressure. 
Then F for first line drug is epinephrine. Remember epinephrine for anaphylactic shock. This drug can be administered IM or sub Q. The dose can be repeated if needed. Also, if the patient is just having a really severe reaction with severe hypotension, they're in the hospital setting where we can give them IV, they may can have this the IV route. And what this epinephrine is going to do is it's going to cause vasoconstriction, which is what this patient needs. So it's gonna compress those vessels. This is gonna help increase blood pressure. It's gonna reduce that swelling that's occurring. And it's also gonna cause bronchodilation. And we need this because remember those airways were narrowing. Next is A for administer per MD order the following drugs. Now the drugs used for anaphylactic shock, it really depends on what's going on with the patient, how severe of a reaction this is. But you want to be familiar with what can be given during anaphylactic shock. And one thing of course is IV fluids because what happened with all this histamine? Well, it caused our vessels to leak. So fluid left that intervascular space, went to the interstitial tissue, and we need fluid back in there. So fluids can be ordered. This will help replace that compartment and increase our blood pressure. Another thing is albuterol, like a nebulizer, a respiratory treatment. And this will help uh, dilate those airways because we had bronchoconstriction. So if that patient has persistent breathing issues, albuterol can be given. Another thing is antihistamines. And this is great because we have a histamine problem. So these antihistamines are gonna reverse the effects of histamine. And um, we're talking about like H1 or H2 blockers. H1 would be diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl that can be given, or an H2 blocker would be renitidine, which would be like Zantac. You can give that and reverse the effects. Another drug is like corticosteroids. This would be given to prevent a recurrent attack later on, it's not gonna give you like immediate treatment. So remember, what was that first line drug? Epinephrine, that's really the big one that we want to remember with that. Then S for stay and monitor the patient. If you have a patient who's went into anaphylactic shock, they appear that they have recovered, you want to watch them very closely because they are at risk for what's called a biphasic anaphylaxis. And this is where the anaphylactic reaction will occur again, even if they're not exposed to the allergen. So this can happen hours after the initial attack and the signs and symptoms that they may get during this attack may be less, worse, or the same. So that's why we tell people who have been at home, they've had anaphylactic reaction, they've had to use their EpiPen, that they need to get treatment immediately because they're at risk for developing another attack. And lastly, T4 teach. As a nurse, we play a vital role in helping our patients understand what anaphylaxis is, what anaphylactic shock is, and how to avoid it in the future. So what are some things we can teach our patient to help them with this? So one thing would be, of course, is the importance of avoiding this particular allergen and that they may need allergy tests to determine if they're allergic to anything else. Also, the importance of wearing medical alert bracelets in case they pass out where someone could see, hey, this person is allergic to this. They may be having anaphylaxis. We need to call help. And to make everyone aware that we'll be providing care to them of their allergen, especially with your pediatric patients. If they have like a peanut allergy, the parent needs to know that the teachers, the school, any caregivers need to know of this child's allergy. In addition, you want to educate the patient about always carrying an EpiPen. No matter what activity you're doing, always carry it with you, have easy access to it. In regards to EpiPens, you wanna make sure that the patient's aware that they do expire and that they need to replace them when they're expired. And they need to know how to prepare and administer the injection. Patient doesn't need to learn how to inject the medication when an anaphylactic reaction is happening. So EpiPens come in trainer devices and you can use a trainer device to teach your patient and have them demonstrate how to use this. So some highlights of how to administer this uh, the epinephrine can be injected through the clothes if needed with this EpiPen. And when they inject, they need to hold it in place for three seconds. So that medication can drip into that muscle fully and then they remove it. 
and after injection, they'll want to massage the injection site for at least 10 seconds. What's this gonna do? It's going to increase the absorption. Then they want to call 911 immediately and get care. Okay, so that wraps up this lecture over anaphylactic shock. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.